Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss the important personality traits which are absolutely essential for success in PhD. Now there are a bunch of different personality traits, but I'm going to focus my attention on three different categories. The first category is your ability to take criticism, your openness to it, your resilience and your adaptability. The second category is to do with your courage and independence of thought. And the third category is your selfishness, very surprisingly, and your street smartness. Now, these ideas and opinions I have developed over the years, not through my own, but in discussion with other professors, with other students. And I would like to extend a special thanks to my own PhD supervisor, Professor Shuman Chakraborty, uh, by discussion with whom I have uh, developed a majority of these ideas and a special thanks to my postdoc advisors also. So without further ado, let's get into this personality traits. The first category is your openness to criticism, your uh, resilience and your adaptability. Now, there are very few absolute truths in this world. And one of them is that if you are not open to criticism during your PhD, then you are not going to be successful. It is as black and white as that. Now, the, there can be different sources of criticism during your PhD, but the most important and the most common source will be your supervisor himself. Now, if you discuss with different PhD students, you will hear a, a lot of different ways in which the supervisor may criticize, but you can rest assured that the most common source of criticism will be on the writing aspect. So what usually happens is that a PhD student comes along, uh, does the research work and then uh, in the first year maybe in the second year writes up the first manuscript and after a lot of effort maybe spread over weeks or months submits the first manuscript to the PhD with a lot of pride in his heart. A couple of weeks later the supervisor comes back with the manuscript filled with red marks, comments, this and that and when this student sees his almost a work of art being completely cut apart like this like these are like these each, each red mark on the on the manuscript feels like a stab wound on his heart. Okay, it is as painful as that. So it's a, it's almost like an existential crisis. But you have to take this. Okay, please do not think that uh, the supervisor is uh, taking it out on you on some kind of a personal level. It is absolutely nothing like that. It is only his or her effort to help you improve. He himself has gone through this very same stage. Uh, at one point in his life. A big problem that is faced uh, on this account is by the academic superstars uh, from the undergraduate days. Okay, so these are the kinds of students who have always been uh, heaped with praises, maybe even from their school days, and when they face this sort of a criticism on their work, they cannot take it. Okay, but you have to understand that you have to have to take this and improve yourself based on these comments uh, and remarks from your supervisor. The next source of criticism is, of course, every student has to face this uh, from the reviewers of their work. So after a paper has been submitted for review, after work has been submitted for review, it comes back from the reviewers and uh, sometimes it can be a little bit spiteful, okay, because uh, what happens mostly is that it's a, a single blind kind of review. So you never get to know the names of the reviewers and sometimes they can get a little bit spiteful and uh, it seems like a total and absolute criticism of your work. So what I say to all my students is that wait for a day or two to cool off before responding to the reviewer's comments. Okay. Now, if the reviewer has been a little bit unprofessional and just said some arbitrary things, I would say it is just like a social problem to manage your emotions and respond, but it is not that difficult a situation. The more difficult situation is when the reviewers have been actually professional about it respectful but they have pointed out certain things which you know in your heart are actually correct so you have made a mistake and all that you can do is go back to the drawing board start from square one and do everything all over again maybe redo the simulations maybe redo the experiments maybe justify the simplifying assumptions that you had taken that you had begun your mathematical modeling with this is the more difficult work and this is where you need a lot of resilience a lot of patience to actually power through this work uh, and what happens is that sometimes 
when the review comes back you have already started on another piece of work and that piece of work may be going on absolutely fine and you want to your every fiber of your being wants to go back to that work continue that work but the 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 situation demands that you have to drop that work and focus your attention on this uh, responding to the reviewer's work okay so it's a it's an emotional roller coaster kind of thing but you have to be resilient enough and adaptable enough to undo uh, this thing please also do not forget like i had mentioned in my earlier video that while all of this is going on uh, you, you can understand that it takes a lot of time sometimes days will turn to weeks weeks will turn to months before you can actually come up with a cogent uh, uh, and coherent response to the reviewer's comments what will happen is that simultaneously you will get some kind of comments while uh, phone uh, phone calls with your family that when you are getting married and this kind of uh, uh, various kinds of disturbing kind of things so it's very very important and difficult also to to keep your cool uh, in these trying times okay so you have to be extremely emotionally stable level headed to handle these kinds of things okay so not just open to criticism but also resilient truly resilient and adaptable the next category the number 2 category is courage and independence of thought in the first one or two years it is quite natural that your supervisor will do a little bit of hand holding will help you guide you by instructing you what to read what to do next but please note that this is not the actual relationship between a phd student and his supervisor because this is more like a boss instructing his worker to do certain things and the sooner that you can get out you can transition from this worker mode of operation to a real researcher mode of operation the better it is for you so what you have to actually do is to go out and explore the domain on your own you have to read you have to actually find out the latest and most important papers uh, that are relevant for your work read them up on your own identify the gap that is there and then you have to bring out come up yourself with fresh and new ideas that you can probably implement on your own and then you have to pitch those ideas to your supervisor so the supervisor's job will ultimately reduce in this ideal scenario to think and guide you on what could be a possible road map based on the ideas that you have generated now this mode of operation this independent researcher mode of operation is not something which comes naturally to us we have been brought up in such a fashion that we are very obedient and subservient in our mentality okay we like to be told what to do next uh, we have a certain passivity in our nature now this kind of a behavior a personality trait is good for world peace but it is not good for independent research work okay so you have to have to force yourself to get into this independent researcher mode of operation and i know that the very idea of thinking for oneself charting out a course of action for oneself following through it by taking some risk uh this is something very very difficult uh you have to force yourself and the greatest danger that you will have to confront with is that when you are following through based on these ideas of your own you will also have to live with the consequences of your own decisions and actions so if you think what i'm going what i'm saying right now seems a little bit like an uh, entrepreneurial adventure uh, you are perhaps right okay so these kinds of idea generation and uh, working it is a little bit of a work like an entrepreneur's work the next category of personality trait is selfishness surprisingly and a little bit of street smartness what do i mean by that usually the students who join phd are the studious types we all know this okay they are the scholar types and typically these are also the kinds of students who are the proverbial good boys and girls imbued with the virtues which makes them kind helpful and compassionate but unfortunately these are also the qualities which breeds uh, a pathological need to win others approval and uh, a constant desire to please everyone around them but this kind of personality is extremely detrimental to the success of phd instead what i think can lead to success in phd is a little bit of street smartness and 
a healthy dose of selfishness. Let me illustrate to you what I mean. Suppose you are a PhD student in a computational domain. You are in a research lab and you are good with computers, maybe good with simulations and programming. People around you know this fact. Very soon, inevitably what will happen is that people will start approaching you for help with their simulation work, with their programming. People even from other departments may approach you for help with their work. Now when you extend your help uh, to others, it feeds into a primordial instinct to feel needed. So definitely you feel very good about yourself. You may even feel that through this help that you are providing, you are actually augmenting your own knowledge and skills. But remember, there are only 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And by investing a non-trivial amount of your time in helping others, are you not perhaps hampering your own work? So this is the part where I want you to think a little bit only about yourself. I mean that you need to start being selfish. I need you to first recognize that your own work is the number one priority. You also need to make it very clear to anyone who approaches you that you will be only able to spare the time to help them after you have completed your own work. So you see, I'm not asking you to be selfish uh, in the sense that you go out and actively harm others for your own benefit. Rather, I'm asking you to be selfish by first thinking about a situation where you do not help others at the cost of harming yourself. There's a big difference between the two. However, let us not stop here. Let us take this one step further. So what I'm saying is that you need not turn away every person who seeks your help. What you can do is you can selectively see who you can really help in the sense that instead of providing an informal kind of help, can you not perhaps transform that informal help into a formal collaboration? You talk with your supervisor about the idea that this person has approached you with. Ask that other person to talk with his or her supervisor also and if it actually turns out that there is a scope for you to provide a meaningful and substantial help whether it is in the coding or the programming or whatever uh, simulation work then together with your supervisor and this other person's supervisor it can be turned into a formal collaboration with the understanding that if something meaningful, something fruitful comes out in the form of a publication your name will be definitely there in the author's list. Remember the Joker's words. If you're good at something, never do it for free. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye.